Hey, Andrew. Hey, Jane. How's it going? Fine. Good. We're finally at the end. I know. Last session. <laughs> what are your plans uh, for the weekend? Um, great question. I don't know. Uh, my partner talked about uh, doing Barbenheimer on okay. Saturday. Wow, both. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we're going to. We'll we'll see. She might just want to take it real easy. She it's said. supposed to be good. Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah. Imelda have the right. Hi, Imelda. Good. How are you? Right. <laughs> Are you in the waiting room? Okay. But our presentation. Yeah, you should jump jump on right now. Okay. See you soon. Okay. What, Sorry. What about so you? No, you should go see it. I've been he hearing such <laughs> great reviews on it. Um, yeah, yeah, for both of them. Yeah, yeah, for for both movies. But no, we're going to go. Yeah, I'm. It's been a little bit overwhelming. Um, we're going on uh, to Mexico tomorrow morning. Oh. And so this week it's been like, but you know, AR papers are due on July 31st. Um, we start up this the academic year with the orientation on August 7th. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm I'm just like been slammed with <laughs> a lot so I don't I feel bad because my mind hasn't been wrapped around I mean I've been attending the conferences but when it comes to this session I'm like I don't know what I should do mm. her buddies have been so good so we'll see we'll see how I'm, many people I'm, show up. I'm sure it'll be great <laughs> that's good um, where um, in uh where in Mexico are you going Mexico City, and then, oh, oh have you been? Uh, my mom's from Mexico City. Oh, um, really? So we, we used to go every year. It got a little too expensive no after a while, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah, we still never, go every once in a while. I never been, so I'm excited to um, go. Um, we're only going, so our total trip is only six days because I actually have to work next Friday in preparation for um, the start of the school year. So I can only squeeze in like Saturday to Thursday. Oh, so we're going to yeah. go to Mexico city and Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> so I want city and I want, you know, resort. Relaxing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But in the city, we're going to do super touristy things. We're going to go mm -hmm. to the, you know, the, the central historical yeah. district. And, um, we're going to go to Chap How do you say it? Chapulta. Mech Park. Yeah, Chapultepec Park. We're gonna do that. We're going to just eat a lot. Yeah. 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 Everything, everything. I have two kids. Yeah. They're eight and eleven. So oh. you know, whatever I we can convince them mm -hmm. to do, we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> Are you gonna go see uh the pyramids? The Teotihuacan? Okay, so I want to. Is it worth out of our very short trip? To do that or should we just come back for it i so the last time i went was a long time ago i don't mm -hmm. remember how much how out of the way it is i know it is out of the way yeah. um uh i know that as a kid i loved it i okay. thought it was the cool like you get yeah and again i don't know what it's like now but we were climbing up the like all yeah. the pyramids and stuff I heard, um, yeah it was just they super still, interesting yeah you yeah. still allow that okay then i need to do that because i so I went to uh, Guatemala when I was single before kids and did the same thing with Tikal, which is an, another um, Mayan mm. um, civilization where we could climb up all the temples and things like that. So I'm, I would love to do the same. Um, um, okay. going to definitely do that then. It's about, they said about an hour, hour and a okay. half, depends on traffic. Hi, Erica. Hello. How are you? All right. Andrew, does it start at 1240 or 12? It, 
Twelve forty. It's the, uh, it says twelve forty on the program, and I think okay. that's that hasn't changed. So okay, good. Um, I know that yesterday the last session only had a few when attending one of the sessions. It didn't have as many people, but it's okay. Yeah. Good. We can have definitely more group whole group conversations then instead of sure. being in breakout rooms. Yeah. Well, nice. if you do need if you do need breakout rooms, just let me know, and I can. Make sure those get set up. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, let me go ahead and um, let me drop some things in chat. Which we might not have to do. Let me screen share as well. And um, I. I did drop all the materials or resources into the resource folder. If you wanna follow along with the slides, um, I'll also actually go ahead and share the actual slides. I had converted them into PDF to make it easier for everyone, but um, let me go ahead and share. And I'm going to go ahead and drop in. Initially, I was thinking we would do Jamboard, but actually, if we have a more intimate, yeah, for to just have conversations. So, I have everything up. And I could put the Jamboard link as well. I guess we won't use it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> Hi, Imelda. Big Hi. day for you. <laughs> Hi. Paul, yeah, first thing I had in my head, it was a little, but no, I'm glad I'm here. My son has actually moved out today. He got a job in San Francisco oh, wow. as, a, as a field. Pick. Bye. Wow. I spent the whole morning hacking. Oh. The U Haul. Wow. You just barely showered and are ready <laughs> to. Yeah, I'm like, I'm here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's it's all good. And that was a big U-Haul truck he's driving up there. Yeah, for a, a an apartment. So mm -hmm. yeah, he and his brother are, are carpooling. They're, they're, that's nice. They're accompanying each other the drive up Love we could that. go today because <laughs> as you all we we have a lot of work on our plate right now my husband and I. <laughs> well we'll go ahead and get started um since it's four minutes in yeah. and Imelda and, and I are happy to have a casual conversation um since it's a more intimate group um, and I'm recognizing a lot of faces from all the other sessions. So I feel like we've already had a lot of the conversations that Imelda and mm -hmm. I were going to talk about. So um, we're going to go ahead and just let you all dictate which direction for us to go. Um, but I do want to start with um, oops, um, talking about who we are, um, because we do recognize that each of the programs have such different uh, roles for supervisors, uh, focus, or as Andrew pointed out, like orientation or philosophy of ed. And, um, and so um, I like to let Imelda do her introduction. Imelda, maybe you could even tell your STEM story, uh, my favorite one about your father. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, so I am a first gen Latina. My parents uh, my dad was finished, went up to school to, in sixth grade and my mother third. So from a rural area in Mexico and they they immigrated here when in the late 70s, I'm sorry, early 70s. And it, it's, uh, it's interesting. And where I grew up actually in LA Unified, uh, I really looked forward to school. I went to school in the 70s and there was still music programs. There were still, um, I looked forward to the LA Unified uh, coffee cake. <laughs> They're famous for their coffee cake. They are. 
<laughs> but um but yeah through that I I I never saw myself really pictured in STEM um although I did gain greater presence and agency ironically through math um because math is what I could speak uh I I came monolingual in Spanish so a lot some my kindergarten teacher thought there was something wrong with me because I did not speak very much in kinder so uh, my mom came in and she was like what um she was surprised they thought the school thought something was going on at home that I quiet it was really that I was just taking in the language it was new for me I had that silent period of just trying to understand what was going on so those experiences, trying to navigate those spaces um, in ways that were unfamiliar for me, really had me do math in a weird way because that I was, my mom could help me in math, that asset, right? The connection to my mom was there, the connection to my dad through, through there. So Needless to say, I, I often say my dad was my first STEM teacher. He was my first uh, science teacher. Every year we, we'd go to Mexico and that is thought of as a negative in, in public schools because ah, you miss so much, right? That's often what, what our teachers would say, you miss so much. But at the same time, we gain so much by gaining um, that familiarity and that connection to culture and community that um, gives us strength throughout the year. So every year we would go and he would take me hiking. He wouldn't call it call it hiking. He would say, oh, let's let's go to the campo. Let's go down and around and 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 I'll show you where I used to walk the cows, where I used to plant the corn and how we used to do it and what we were able to eat, not eat on, on our overnight stays as they stayed out in the, in the fields farming, uh, how they used to till the soil with a mule. All of that had so much science embedded in it that I didn't really understand the connections until I, I majored in, in science and biology and I really better understood how plants worked and how my dad's stories came alive um, through his own narrative but connected to science. And it was it was beautiful for me to try to really bridge that. And that's something that I, I think often isn't highlighted in our schools where we ask our students their stories around plants, their stories around food and cooking. There are so many connections that we can make to everyday life uh, and to their own experiences by eliciting and listening. So that that's, I strive to, create and cultivate that environment with our students um environment but also that critical connection that we we can bridge these worlds in in ways where our students feel like they belong thanks imelda i always enjoy hearing that story um and i'll try to keep mine brief so that we have time for everybody else to have those conversations as well in breakout rooms um but my STEM story is really about the model minority, a myth about Asians being great at math and science. My father was actually a philosopher and an author. Uh, he, was a, he was a writer. And my mom similarly was into arts and being creative. And yet for some reason, growing up in Montebello where there were two separate groups, um, in my school system. There was the uh, Mexican-American Chicano uh, families, and then there was the Asian uh, immigrant families. And the teachers just made assumptions about all the Asian students, including myself, where we were expected to take honors and AP classes um, in math and science. And um, I often had teachers shame me for not being good at math. And so I felt like I was supposed to be great at it. I wasn't thriving. I wasn't doing as well in those spaces. And I carried that with me through college and, and felt always like I was outside of STEM spaces, even though I was trying to pursue at, um, at UCLA an engineering degree. And so when I 
started teaching in an LAUSD school, I really felt like my role and purpose was to um, bring more joy and more um, help students feel like they belong in STEM spaces. And I appreciate that with Imelda's positionality and mine, we've really uh, focused with our STEM pre-service teachers um, in bringing joy and healing into STEM spaces for their most vulnerable and marginalized students. And so um, that's our focus for today. So saying that, um, oops, sorry, let me go ahead and scroll down. Um, I'm gonna ask you to do a couple Jamboard activities, but, and have a conversation about it in small groups. Um, and um, I don't know, I feel like maybe this is a little bit out of order, but I do wanna say that um, in sharing your STEM stories, maybe we can think about like how this is more, not just individual stories, but it is about like a greater institutional and systemic issue with STEM. Um, STEM is always viewed as neutral, objective. There's no space for culture, identities, or conversations around politics or social issues. Um, we often hear teachers say, oh, it's so hard to integrate good math teaching or good science teaching and be social justice. And um, fortunately in our particular program, because our students are, are majority, um, uh, we, we uh, recruit teachers who are from marginalized backgrounds um, that have identities that are um, similar to the demographic of our K-12 students. And we have found that our student teachers also require time to heal and think about how STEM has harmed them. So although they're going into math and science teaching, it's, a, it's a incredible the kinds of exclusion they felt in K-12 and college spaces um, as STEM students themselves. So uh, we, we like to think of our purpose is to advance civil rights within um, STEM education, just like Robert Moses um, was an advocate, advocate for that. We also um, um, ascribe to McGee. This book is amazing. She talks about like just the whole history of STEM and how it's harmed so many of our marginalized students throughout the whole pipeline of K through college. And, and yet, um, and yet we, and, and our society um, is harmed by that because we don't hear the voices of, of all the people who participate in our society. And that when large communities are excluded from STEM spaces, excuse um, what STEM and technology is for and what it does. Um, and then also, um, I think this was brought up earlier, was it, um, I don't know if it was um, Lorena, but um, about abolitionist teaching and within abolition, abolitionist teaching is uh, this fundamental core value of being anti-racist, um, but also, uh, you know, although we're resisting white supremacy, I think what Imelda and I like to do as supervisors and faculty of STEM students is also to really um, center joy and love in STEM because so much of the emotion has been stripped away from what science and math is. And so um, reintegrating that because as Imelda said, you know, our history, our ancestors, they lived and experienced math and science all around them. And it was part of their integral culture and life. And yet we've compartmentalized it into something that is devoid of all those joyful feelings of community and uh, relational. Um, yeah, I, I often I often connect uh, this individualistic notion that has been so prominent in STEM spaces as antithetical to what we see mostly in nature. When we have quote unquote survival of the fittest, we actually have a negative cost to the people who are there. But wh whenever we have collaboration and community, 
you actually lift each other up. And often those stories in, in for instance, in science and evolution and biology aren't highlighted. The ones that are highlighted are that survival, that individualism, but there's so, so much strength in, in being with each other, hearing each other and recognizing each other's humanity, love and joy that we try to really bring those pieces in. Um, have photo narratives. Most of our students, as, as Jay noted, over 70% of them are first gen. This is in STEM, in our STEM cohort. Over 80% of them uh, are students of color, 85 in some years. So we have, um, in terms of who comes to this space, uh, they are hungry for this. They are hungry to belong in STEM. And we often hear, oh, your, your classes feel different. I, I don't feel like I'm in a, in an undergrad or a, a STEM class. I, I feel like uh, I'm in a community. I don't feel like I have to compete. So critical. Uh, we often hear that from our students. I don't feel like I have to compete with with my peers. I feel like I can collaborate and, and we work together for this bigger purpose. So I think Imelda and I did enough talking and you have <laughs> access to the slides. So, um, you know, uh, so our, our title of this session is Healing and Rightful Presence. I'm gonna skip this part, but it is a big part of, uh, we have some authors that and readings that um, we're, we're happy to share with you. Um, in this work, um, and there are tenets to rightful presence, which is this belief that it's beyond it, inclusion. It's not just about diversity and, and, and equity and inclusion, but they have a right, our students have a right to shape what STEM means for them and STEM education is for them. So saying that, um, we're gonna go ahead and place um, maybe everyone and maybe um, some breakout groups yeah, and, yeah. you know, have a discussion about the Jamboard questions. You can post on Jamboard or just discuss or do both, um, but introduce yourself. What is your role and context in your program? What is a STEM story you would like to share? And also when thinking about supervision and walking into all these classroom spaces, what is it that you want to see or feel? What do you want students to see or feel in those STEM spaces? And so um, maybe 10 minutes. And Andrew, how many rooms do you think we need, Imelda? Maybe three, two? Maybe three. Yeah, three. Maybe two? Three, three. so they can have um, an intimate conversation. Yeah, these conversations yeah. Can, <laughs> can be deep. Sure, let's do it. <laughs> All right, um, I'll Thank go ahead and open those now then. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, Michelle. Oh. Um, and I'm happy to hang out in here. And if anyone joins late, direct them to a breakout room. Um, and okay. let folks know when uh, they're going to be brought back, stuff like that. All right. Sounds okay. good. Should we join one then? Yeah. Why not? Which one? I'll do you join go? three because it's they only have two. Okay. And then, um, but yeah, this is going fast. It's already going to 30 minutes, right? It yeah, really I know. <laughs> okay. I got the yeah. time. You, you have 40 minutes. For some reason, I thought we said it We have 40 minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. It'll be but good. It's going fast. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'll join uh, room three. All right. I'll join room one and then two.
Can you hear me, Mary? Hi, Mary. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. All right. Um, glad those Zoom issues were resolved. Um, so right now, folks are in some breakout rooms. All right. Um, I can wait till they come back. I'm good. Okay. I don't. I. It might be a little bit of time. Uh, I don't know exactly how long they were planning to um, stay in those rooms, but. For the time being, at the very least, I can share uh, some links to some of what's been going on so far. So that first link is 
um, the the slides, and then the second link is Jamboard. A Jamboard, yeah, and I think that's what they're working on right now. Um, I'm happy to to put you in a room with. Um, Go ahead. If that if it's if we can do that, that's fine. Do I need yeah. to, do I need to click on a link? Uh, you don't. I I think you'll probably want to look at the Jamboard. Um, but you should have access to those even if I put you in a room. I believe. Uh, okay. The link so, should still okay. be there. I'll wait for you to put me in a room. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Andrew, um, hey. I didn't even check the Jamboard, but maybe we can just ask people to spend a couple minutes of their breakout time to, I can put that in uh, break broadcast. Because I know someone just got into a room, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I shared the Jamboard and the slides with them. Um, so okay, they great. should have access to those. Let me just message them maybe two more minutes. Yeah, two more minutes. If you have to what's your STEM story? Huh. Uh, the one I usually describe is um so I I was a math teacher um but I didn't really like math a whole lot until <laughs> I was like in my 20s um I started recognizing like oh this is this is just like kind of formalizing the ways I think about things already in a lot of ways um and sort of very selfishly I, I thought you know I don't think math is being taught right uh like in K through 12. So that's why I ended up becoming a math teacher. But, um, you know, that's a very, I think, specific and like discipline specific uh, injustice, I guess. Um, and it is, um, you know, I, I am especially white, math. Yeah. Like I'm white presenting at least. And like if, if I am from like one of the most privileged groups uh, and I find that math isn't really mm -hmm. working for me, like what does that say for everyone else that? um like has even more obstacles and barriers to overcome um so absolutely 100 percent. it really is like when robert moses said that he so he talks about how he was a civil rights leader and he made major advancements including with the constitution in civil rights but in a lot of his talks he talks about how math is the last place that he has not felt like he's won civil rights or black mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. math. So it's one of the most challenging spaces I find <laughs> when yeah. it comes to equity and social justice, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I assume, I I don't want to make assumptions. Uh, do you, have you read Rochelle Gutierrez's work? Yes. Um, have and what why do you bring it up oh just uh um like conversations around like you know very specifically math is a discipline that like we see as uh like politically neutral and it's yeah. probably going to take a lot of work to disrupt that idea um yes yeah it It's it's interesting because um, I work with math and science uh, pre-service teachers and science folks, they get it. They're like, well, you got to make some shifts. Math folks, they're like, but math, like you said, is politically neutral. So you're asking us to do additional stuff besides teach math and they separate the two things. Yeah. Right so yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good point you bring up. Yeah. 
I don't know. But let's see what people say. Uh, it's interesting because in the room, I stayed in room one because I realized that some of them were former math teacher. One was, and I was about to leave. But when the other person started speaking, she was like, I don't know anything about math and science. Hmm. Then being a supervisor of that, what is that like? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome back. Just wondering if anybody had thoughts. I don't know, Imelda, did you hear anything good in your room? <laughs> ah, a lot of great conversation. Um, uh, you know, everything from really having uh, us as educators put, try to put ourselves in our student shoes. I, you know, Gwen noted how um, someone someone was doing professional development and they came in and asked them about um, them liking school. And a lot of teachers are have positive relationships with, with school, not all, but many of them. And uh, really having them think, well, what about your students? Do they like school, right? And really having them think about that, that connection of how might we develop a space where they find joy in themselves in that classroom space. Lorena, I didn't get a chance to pop into your room. Did anything come up in your space? Oh, we had a great conversation. I was with uh, Johnny and, is it Lisa? Um, and uh, Johnny was sharing some really cool uh, rehumanizing mathematics stuff. So I wonder, he should probably talk about that. Um, but Lisa was also talking about arts and integration of, you know, ideas, body, you know, mind, all sorts of big, big things that we, that are possibilities, right? Real possibilities. Tell me if I captured those. <clears throat> well, Johnny, you shared an article that I think Andrew was just yeah. talking about, right? Oh, thank you, Andrew. I, I shared it because um, I was at a math talk. Rochelle Guterres start, essentially started this notion of rehumanizing mathematics. And I shared that I went to a talk of hers and went to speak to her afterwards. And um, all three of us, Lorena, Lisa, and I all have humanities backgrounds. We like to be the rounded kind of people who care about lots of different things. <laughs> and so after this, after Rochelle's talk, I went up to her and we didn't really have a full conversation, but I asked what might STEM people learn from how the humanities are taught. And that's a, in all the things about joy and just about expression. The idea in the humanities is not everybody makes the same thing, not everybody makes the same path. Um, I was sharing that when I was learning to do the arts, it was always about people gathered around a table making things that mattered to them and talking about things that they cared for and nobody had to be like anybody else. And that was something important. Thanks, Ronnie so important that we yeah I mean and as Andrew had said you know it's about making math political when when for so long they've said that math is not political yes it is it's political every day the choices that we make as math teachers we're making political decisions every day and um and so I, I appreciate um Johnny and Andrew bringing up Rochelle uh, Michelle, you said something too in our uh, breakout room that I thought was interesting about your personal story, STEM story, growing up. I don't want to talk so much, honey. So you have to you have to forgive me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I do. I just I like I'm so blessed to be able to talk for a living now. <laughs> um, great, you know. Um, was it my story about my father? Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, very. Of you, um, I live in Ventura County. Um, we came to Ventura County um, from Ibukuni, Japan. I spent my elementary years going to a Department of Defense schools in uh, Ibukuni, Japan. My dad was in the Navy. He was, actually was the very first African American parachute rigger. Made sixty four parachute jumps. Packed people's parachutes okay. on airplanes all over. And it's an amazing story because he said, you know, people never ask or question that there's an African American man packing your parachutes. There was never a question of color when your life is on the line. 
and you pack two shoots, you have one jump shoot and you have one backup shoot in case people didn't know that. But yeah, I grew up in that environment. And so going to school, um, I was always kind of sh- told and pushed to the side, like, you know, girls don't get math and black girls especially don't get math. It's not part of us and we don't understand it and told on and on and on. And I'm thinking, well, that kind of goes against what's happening at home when I've been to my dad's parachute mm-hmm. off at Point Goo and seen him doing this leader. I mean, you cannot pack a parachute without having some kind of mathematics background, deep background. So it kind of was that kind of conflicted. Um, spent a summer when I first started teaching way long time ago in the early 80s at Tri-County's Math Project at UCSB. Learned that I was math phobic, relearned how to enjoy and embrace um, and incorporate mathematics through storytelling. Mm. I'm an avid believer that you can teach anything through children's literature, storytelling. Went back and myself and two other colleagues created a K-8 professional development for the whole district, uh, incorporating math concepts using the math standards and children's literature throughout. Work with the librarians at the school sites and language arts teachers, those kind of things. We can teach anything, anything, I believe through a wonderful story, piece of children's literature. So that's why I've kind of relearned mathematics and I shared with my teacher candidates, do not be afraid. It's learn how you learn that subject best. And I think especially as we're told growing up that we're not good at something or your people don't matter or you don't know, you know, that kind of thing. That's a bunch, excuse me, that's a bunch of crap. And, um, but yeah, you have to embrace your own learning and story and kind of do a self-discovery as we do with with any of these topics. So I hope that's kind of what you, <laughs> I talk so much <laughs> and, I'm babysitting, and I'm babysitting today. So, uh, oh, so I'm doing well to remember all of that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Anybody else wanted to add anything, anything to the conversations you've had? I think Erica also, you noted, um, that that self discovery, kind of like the archaeology of self. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Celia Ruiz. Yeah. In terms look, of, looks like Lisa wanted to talk too. Well, now you're making me laugh because the archaeology of self. I just had this here in California. Thought of well, you can either do a doctorate or you can have therapy, like. Like it requires an archaeology of self down to how you learn and, and distilling then for yourself what is your comfort zone of learning versus what you do have an affinity for versus what brings you joy and or terror. Like those are turns out all different things. I had no idea. Took that level of, of, of like distilling to, to get there. So we could probably save people some time by telling them to do one or the other going forward. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's just a joy to think about differentiated learning at a, 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 a dynamic and three-dimensional way. And sometimes I hear that conversation in a very small box. And when I think of the arts, I think of differentiated learning in terms of the expression of it and demonstrations of understanding in a much bigger box. I appreciate you bringing up it, it does, it is, so we have found that our um, student teachers that have, they actually come with math and science degrees, undergraduate degrees, and yet mm-hmm. when we have them delve into the archaeology, uh, archaeology of themselves, of their STEM stories, so much of their stories are actually quite negative mm-hmm. about STEM. And yet they want to be STEM teachers. And this is something that they find that is a therapy moment for them and realizing that it's not their fault that they had these experiences. They actually truly internalize blame. They thought it was them. They thought it was because I'm not smart enough or I'm not good enough. You know, and they and they realized that that was not the case, um, that they needed to stop blaming themselves. Because otherwise, they're, they're going to do the same things to their own students, right? That they're going to think that it's their students' fault that they're not doing well in these STEM spaces and not really critically thinking about what is what is the problem. It's this greater um, institutionalized oppression that we do to our students in STEM spaces. And how do we then resist that oppression and reimagine a different way of teaching and learning math and science. And then what's our role in that as supervisors then? How do we center 
that vision for change and kind of hold that pillar for them as they're trying to figure out for themselves what that all means and unpack all their emotions and history around it. And so um, saying that, uh, how much time do we have? Okay, let me go ahead and share. Yeah, for but we have about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so just uh, wanted to maybe go on to the next steps of thinking about, um, um, and so I think there's been a common theme of like, wow. And I like what Andrew said when I was talking with him, like, uh, uh, do you want to speak about your, your feelings about being white and privileged? And so what does this look like for, I don't want to speak for you, Andrew. Oh, I, I mean, it, you know, I, I never got the impression that math education is working for me as someone from a pretty privileged background. Um, so upon when I started teaching, you know, I started reflecting on, well, what does that say for the students that have like far greater obstacles, far greater barriers to overcome uh, in their math journey? Um, yeah, I think that's that's a big motivation for why I decided to start teaching math. Great, I know. And so keeping that hope up for our very brand new math and science teachers that they can do something different and not just reproduce um, what they've experienced. And I think that's something that came up. I think Nellie was talking about that, like how so much of what she sees in supervision is our students reproducing the traditional harmful ways of teaching math and science through lecture, through um, this is right and wrong. There's only one way instead of what all of you have brought to this story about data, about telling stories and connecting it to our lived experiences and our fam familial ancestral experiences. And, um, and, and there, it's so much more, it can be so much more rich uh, experience for, for our students. Um, so, um, sorry, Lisa, I'm looking at chat now in your conversation. Do you consider turning the curriculum on its head and starting in world with math and science rather than the classroom? Um, would that address creating humanizing experiences for students and TCS? And Erica mentioned UDL. Uh, yes, I mean, love to have this conversation with you about, about your thoughts about what you think uh, math and science could look like and what we can do. And so that is actually the next thing that I'd like us to think about is, um, having a vision for it and then how we're, how we would engage in it. And initially Amelda and I had thought about like going over a observation protocol and do you still have access to it? It's in the resource folder. Um, but with only 10 minutes left, I think what I would prefer to do is to have you, um, go back to those Jamboard slides and look at slides eight through 11 and, maybe have a discussion about how do you envision your role as a supervisor in STEM education? Now that we've had this conversation and maybe thoughts are swirling about this upcoming year, what is something that we can do that's healing and brings a rightful presence to our most marginalized students? What can we commit to in centering uh, a, a change in the way math and science can be experienced for our black and brown students, for our students who are LGBTQIA+, for our students with disabilities, who are often excluded from any kind of STEM conversation. How can they see themselves in it? And so let me give you some silent time to maybe think about these two questions. And then we'll open up breakout groups.
you've never used a Jamboard, you can cut a sticky note and write in it and then expand it or shrink it as much as you want. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open up breakout rooms again, or I think actually, Andrew, you're in charge of that. And we have only a few minutes left. So maybe, I don't know, five minutes to just think about what is one commitment we can make specifically for our STEM spaces and our STEM students. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the what, what can we do? I often think to Come on, come on. the system it's, it starts with us right it starts with every single relationship and who we are in relationship to where our students are uh same same rooms as before mm -hmm. sounds good thank you thank you andrew thank you andrew sure thing Interesting, Andrew, because in your session, I felt like there were only three people posting on Padlet. Yeah. And same thing here where I think they don't know how to post. That's, is that what that's, it is? I, that's my suspicion as well. I don't really, I, I don't know though. Because um, it seemed like they had a lot of thoughts in your session mm -hmm. when we were in breakout groups, um, but it didn't look like they had written that out. Um, and then I'm seeing the same with the Jamboard. Maybe they are writing on like a separate, you know, journal or a paper, but they're not writing on the actual Jamboard. I, I felt like it was safe to assume everyone knows how to use Jamboard and Padlet mm -hmm. by this point, but maybe that's not a fair assumption mm -hmm. to make. Um, something to I keep agree. in mind, I guess. And yeah. when I, um, I forget, yesterday we were in a session where it was a conversation in our break, breakout group about Basically, uh, and I didn't realize this, that a lot of supervisors are actually retired educators, mm -hmm. and which means that they're well past in their 60s, right? And so I do imagine that. And then someone had brought up today at a breakout room, like with the tech stuff, that she feels like we need a tech PD, and that tech mm -hmm. is really kind of like the barrier in terms of social justice as well. And so that was really an interesting conversation. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
something that Ooh. we should consider. I just noticed Nellie's in a room by herself. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll go in there and then we're going to have to close okay. out anyway. So I'll let you yeah. close us out. Okay. All right. Okay. Sure. Uh, should I bring everyone back at like 1 39? Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Okay. Okay. All right, that was quick. And we have run out of time. <laughs> Nellie and I only got to talk for like, I feel like 10 seconds, but um, thank you so much for being here. And I appreciate you joining us on a Friday afternoon. Is there anybody who wants to say anything before we say our official good goodbyes? Well, just one thing that we have to find out what our students that are as a teacher we have to find out what our students stories are mm -hmm. for the student teacher to find them out before they can really be um you know effective agree gwen absolutely agree thank you gwen all right we have exciting sessions to come and and resources are there um like like jane noted we have a framework, a, a kind of process, but in that process, uh, always better understand how and why our students uh, got to those instructional decisions. And so much of it stems from who they are and who their students are. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, see you at the closing session. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you, Andrew, Johnny, Lisa. <laughs> Alisa, you're muted. Quick question. Sure. Just a, a curiosity about, I've always thought that it's going to be artists who are going to redefine what the tests look like because tests are still attached to funding. And you're making me think about how to invite STEM people into that conversation. Pull in from your genius about how those don't look like this and that. How do we broaden our understanding of demonstrations of understanding of students to help shift this? Well, Lisa, that makes me think about hey, why not even go bigger? Why are we siloed? Why is it that humanities is over here, STEM is over here, and we make decisions separately all the time? I think ego, unfortunately, is one of the variables. <laughs> People get, get with their stuff, and then they're like, hmm, that's my stuff. And if we right. can have that cocktail party and get rid of that circle right. of siloing, that'd be a start. But I'm curious to think more about what the other variables are. Right. Or addressable and objective, if you will. Absolutely. Or institutional hurdles that we put in our own way. 
Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lisa. I appreciate your contributions. And yeah, hopefully the session was, I don't know, it's something that I grapple with every day is what is my role for STEM? Because it's such a it's such a, 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 a traditional space in a time when we should be thinking of new ways, like you said, like even with assessments and things that go beyond STEM spaces. I mean, I think we're two houses of like, how do we know what we know? Mm -hmm. Us wanting to learn, and then the, how are we going to pay for this? <laughs> I think those are real and different, unfortunately. Right. Um, so yes, that bigger, broader thinking, I think is useful to us. Um, yeah, I don't know, you're, you're, you're making me think about my education question, which is different than STEM, but it was a tension in that I went to private schools in New York City, and then I came to San Francisco and I went to public schools and nobody at the public school, it was an under-resourced school and nobody was happy. And that question has stuck with me my whole life. Like the principal doesn't wanna be here. The teachers mm -hmm. don't want to be here. They're mm -hmm. paying chocolate to do not a lot of work. Mm -hmm. The teachers really don't want to be here. Right. And fights are in the bathroom. There's mm -hmm. toilets with heads in the toilets, mm -hmm. with people in the toilets, in mm -hmm. the girls' bathroom. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be here. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. So that's always been sort of my leading question.